Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanek with Figure It Out Baseball. We've got a really exciting podcast for you today. Uh, we're joined by the head coach at Mississippi State, Chris Lamonis, a uh, guy that I've known for for quite some time and uh, been a while since we've caught up, so I'm excited to get into a conversation with him. Um, I'll give you a quick background on him just before we jump into questions with him. Um, he is a 1992 graduate of the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, after his playing career there, a very successful playing career, he spent 12 seasons as an assistant coach at the Citadel, in which time the team went to five NCAA regionals. From there, he moved to uh, went on to Louisville. He spent eight seasons as, as an assistant coach at Louisville, in which time the team went to seven NCAA regionals, seven out of eight years. In his time at Louisville, the team averaged an incredible 44.9 wins a season. Uh, they had seven straight recruiting classes ranked in the top 30 nationally and made three trips to the College World Series. In 2015, this, this, this is the spring now, the spring of 2015, he was hired as an assistant, I'm sorry, as the head coach at Indiana. He was the head coach at Indiana from 2015 through 2018. In that time, Indiana went to three regionals. That was three regionals in, in, in uh uh, the schools only went to eight regionals in the history of the program, and three of those were in four years uh, when Chris Lamonis was the head coach. And then 2019 was his first season as the head coach at Mississippi State. In 2019, the, uh, he became the winningest first-year head coach in SEC history, leading the team to a 52-15 and 15 mark, uh, led the team to the College World Series in Omaha. Uh, they had four All-Americans, 11 players drafted that tied the school record, uh, pretty incredible first year, and uh, Chris, we just really appreciate you spending some time with us today on the podcast. No problem. I uh, always like, uh, you know, talking and getting the knowledge out there and, and trying to. I listen to podcasts all the time myself. It feels like I'm, I'm trying to figure out something. So it, especially during recruiting season, I try to find them on my uh, my radio so I can keep me busy at, as I'm driving down the highway. Now, do you stay do you stay pretty busy? Obviously, your background. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I know that's obviously, but your background is in recruiting. Do you still do a good bit of recruiting as a head coach at this point? I think so. Uh, I'm probably not on the uh, at the events all the time as much, but um, I've really tried to. As you move up through this, I've had a lot of former head coaches, and uh, who are. I mean, Ray Tanner made the comment to me at one time. Don't forget what got you to that point. You know, in terms of, and mine a lot was about recruiting. So I feel like I have a pretty pretty good you know grasp on it in our program. I have. When I took over, I got uh, Jake Gotro as our recruiting coordinator. He's phenomenal. Um, he grew up in Texas, played and in, in coached in Louisiana, in those Mississippi, and then I hired Scott Foxall, who was the Auburn recruiting coordinator for a long time. So, you know, he knew Alabama, Georgia, Panhandle, so we feel like. And then my volunteer was Kyle Cheesebro, who was my recruiting coordinator at in Indiana. So um, recruiting is the biggest, as you read off my intro, and, talk about all the accolades it's all about players and so you know for us the recruiting piece is is at the forefront of what we do in this program you know recruiting and development you spent a long time as a recruiting coordinator obviously you trust your own skills and your own judgment how difficult is it to be a head coach and then have to put that same trust in the hands of your assistants your recruiting coordinator as far as making players on decisions and, and kind of letting them do that when it was you making those decisions for so long? It's tough because there's certain things that I, um, that I want as we build a team. You know, as you're building a team and trying not to have any holes, you obviously want to have superstars but no holes. And so I always tell my guys, well, I really don't like – I'm really not wanting that type of player in this system, but convince me. You know, argue with me. Tell me why. Why should we make an exception for this guy? Because, um, you know, we've had all different guys be great ball players. That's the amazing part about baseball is Jose Altuve can prove it. You know, uh, we really don't want a small guy here or a big guy here. And um, our game just plays to a lot of different things. But we have a blueprint of what we want. Uh, luckily, in this day and age, I get to see a lot of video. I get to see a lot of kids. I, I have um, – really good relationships with a lot of travel programs and high school programs. So it's a combination of everything. But if one of my guys comes in and fights for a kid and says, we have to have this kid, the trust factor between us is, is so high that I just have total buy-in. How specific can you get with things that you like and don't like with a player um, at a level like Mississippi State? Uh, you know, clearly there's, there are, there aren't that many players in the country to begin with that, you know, talent-wise can play for you guys. Um, 
So when you're kind of sorting through the, the different types of players that you like and maybe different personalities or, or traits of, of a player, how specific are you able to get in kind of weeding some things out that you don't want to be a part of your program? Well, you know, we're looking for – we're not looking for a one-dimensional guy most of the time. Every once in a while we'll take a guy that can just hit or just do something. Um, you know, for us, we like – you know, man, we like athletic. You know, I like some bigger bodies. I think when you go to spring training you see some bigger bodies. But I've had some great smaller players, so it's not every piece of it. But, we're you know, we're wanting some guys that we feel like can have – be multidimensional at the plate but also have the ability to take their athleticism and, and play great defense. Because I feel like when you get to those regionals and super regionals, man, the ability to, to defend and not give extra outs is huge or make a great play in the outfield. I mean, we go to Omaha last year, and Jake Mangum brings back a home run with the bases loaded in the first inning against Stanford. And I'm about to have my – couldn't swallow while that ball was in the air. But um, <laughs> just, you know, guys who can really defend is, is a big piece. And then – you know, on the mound, there's just so many different pieces. And we'll take, you know, one of this or something like that. But, you know, overall, you're wanting some guys that have clean arms. You know, I mean, obviously, we'll take a funk guy here and there if we feel like he's a bullpen piece. And, you know, it seems like in our league, the left-handed piece is so big. Left-handed hitters and left-handed pitching uh, is a commodity anywhere. But here, I feel like, um, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. So we're, we've been a little bit more left-handed of late. But, um, I think we're about to swing back to the right-handed side because we've got too many. But, you know, little things like that as we're moving through. And then I just, you know, um, it's so hard because we recruit kids early now. The makeup piece and, and, and what's behind these kids is a, is a big piece for us. I mean, it's just every kid that we sign at this level has talent. And you go to the field and stand on the chain link fence and see talent. But, you know, what's their makeup? What makes them tick? You know, what um, can they handle failure? I mean, and, and that's a that's a big piece for us because, and, and you know, here you're going to fail and you're going to fail on a big stage at times. And can you get back up and play the next day um, is is a hard part of it because, you know, we talk about it with our team all the time. I mean, we're getting punched in the nose. I mean, you play in the SEC West. I mean, you're going to have a <clears throat> – baseball is a game with a tough matchup and get beat. And you got to get back up and play the next day. So that resiliency piece of kids is you're trying to figure out as much as you can about them. That's probably too much of an answer for you. Though. No, it's great. No. I, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's good stuff. I'm taking notes here. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, so as you as you're going through, you know, it, anytime you've got to have a, a new guy on staff or you're hiring a recruiting co- recruiting coordinator for the first time, you know, what are you looking for when you're hiring that guy? What about a, a guy's background specifically tells you uh, that he's the right fit for you and, and does any kind of a personal relationship come in there? Like, you, you know, you prefer to hire a guy that, you know, previously, uh, does that play a part in who you're hiring? Well, I think there's, there's two parts of it. Yeah. I mean, I've hired two in my career to this point. Um, and both guys I had, well, I take that back. I really didn't have a, I knew Jake Gotro, but you know, Kyle Cheeseboro who I had hired and I had coached him, I had coached with him. And so we had a prior relationship and then getting to meet Jake, Jake was kind of my first hire when I got here at, you know, Mississippi state. And, um, luckily it was a great hire because she just won national assistant coach of the year. But, you know, organizations, a big piece with these recruiting coordinators, man, just, you know, how many phone calls you have to take, how many events you have to take, where you're going, how it's trying to plan out that 11.7 and, you know, just all that, there's a real, you need to be really organized, but the most important piece and not even being able to assess talent and see talent, it's got to be a relationship guy. And both guys that I've had work for me and they're still working for me are just unbelievable relationship guys. And that's with the kids and that's with their parents, but even most of all with their high school coaches and their travel ball coaches, that relationship side is, it's, it's got to be good, but it's also got to be true. Like they, you know, both my guys, I feel like, are very, very true and in, into what they do and believe. And, um, and they build really strong relationships. And in the recruiting world, you know, when I first got to Louisville, man, we didn't have any Chicago kids. And we went up there and got one kid from one organization. And he came down and had a great career. And then we were able to go get the next guy. Because how that kid was coached and how that kid was treated, you end up getting into areas. And now you look in Chicago. And, man, it seems like Louisville has every player in there. But they're – it's because they they have such a great track record in recruiting those kids and working with those travel programs that um, two were created a long time ago. And 
you, you kind of answered this uh, to a point, but I'm going to ask you just a little more specifically. What do you think, in your opinion, separates a good recruiter from a great recruiter? Because as a former recruiter myself, I know there are a lot of things if I could go back, I would do a little bit differently or I'd pay a little more attention to this or that. And, and obviously the separation from a guy that's going to be a career Division II or, or maybe mid-major Division I recruiting coordinator to a guy who can be successful at your level, you know, that, that margin, um, I don't know how, how big it is. Uh, but I imagine there's a, there are a couple small things really that can kind of make a difference. So in your opinion, what separates a good recruiter from a great recruiter? You know, there's a lot of good recruiters. That's as, as you look across the board. And um, for me, <clears throat> as I was out recruiting, you know, everybody does certain events, right? Everybody recruits the big event in the summertime or this big event in the summertime. I always felt one of the separators for me um, was I recruited when it was uncomfortable. You know, I have a Sunday afternoon off and, all of a sudden somebody calls me and asks, tells me, hey, Joe's pitching over here. He's got a chance. And I just felt like, you know, I, I would always make the extra trip or the extra phone call. And I learned that from Dan McDonald there at Louisville. It just, he would always make an extra phone call or make an extra trip. Because um, like I said, you see some guys, everybody's at the big events. And everybody recruits in the summer. Um, and we spent a lot of our time recruiting during the season. You know, we're, right when we got to Louisville, as, as a recruiting coordinator, I'd miss games. Now, we don't have to miss games as much anymore, but – and we were playing catch-up, you know, and Kentucky had just won the SEC, and, um, man, they were they were controlling the area, and, man, we had to play catch-up. And, you know, even – I can remember in – I think it was 2014, we won our uh, Super Regional, I guess, and um, we finished late in the night, and the next morning at 8 o'clock I was in Indianapolis watching a game, and, you know, Quinn Moore was like, man, you, you're nuts, you know, like the Indiana Bulls coach, like, hmm. what are you doing? But I said, and I was spirit, you know, you're going to Omaha. The bad thing when you go to Omaha is you miss out on a couple of weeks of recruiting, and I wanted to make sure we, just, we were trying to see one guy and showing that guy that, hey, man, I'm here for you was a big piece. So I, I kind of felt like in answering that question, it's, it's, you know, I would always go on the trip or the, I'd be the one guy at a place all by myself because it's, you know, trying to do something outside the box. You know, the big the big events, yeah, those are important, and I went to all those, but it was a it was a lot more that time of year when other people weren't recruiting and we were allowed out. So through the years as a coach, were you out on the road recruiting but also sort of taking mental notes of what coaches around you were doing those sort of things? So if you guys had a spot open up at Louisville, that, uh, you know, that your recommendation would, would help with or like as you became a head coach? Or were you kind of looking for those type of guys that fit the mold of, uh, of what you would like to hire or a guy you'd like to work next to as you were also recruiting players? Well, I think so. I mean, I, that's, that's part of everything you're doing, building relationships. And it's funny, when I left, uh, when I left Louisville, um, I had a really good relationship with Eric Snyder, um, who was at Illinois at the time. And Eric Snyder, to me, I was also the hitting guy, um, but any time I saw Eric Snyder, I was picking his grain because he's a phenomenal hitting guy, you know. And uh, he would give me a hard time for recruiting Illinois kids, but we would talk. And when I left, Dan asked me, hey, who do you hire? You know, I gave him a couple of names, but I said, man, this guy Eric Snyder is really good. And uh, he also, you talk about knowing Illinois, Wisconsin. I mean, this guy has lived it, done it. He's probably the most respected guy up there and um, ended up being a great hire for Dan, and he has done a phenomenal job. So, um, you know, but that's just, you know, you're looking and watching guys. In my world right now, you're always looking, seeing who's doing good, because in my world, um, my my assistants, man, they can be head coaches tomorrow, you know. So I always have to be in that, that world and trying to assess and, and see who's doing well. And teaching our game right now is kind of crazy because, you know, what we were teaching 10 years ago may not be what we're teaching now. We spent we spent our classroom time yesterday talking about defensive shift. You know, ten years ago we weren't. You know, we'd move a guy one foot one way or the other, but <laughs> you weren't moving your shortstop to the other side of the field. So uh, you have to be evolving. And and right now, the, a lot of the, the the new thought process is with our younger coaches. So you're seeing that with us losing a lot of guys to pro ball. You see a lot of guys going to pro ball, and if you're if you're on Twitter and, and follow baseball guys on Twitter, even at this time of year, this is, you know, we're in late January right now. Um, your season is fast approaching, and I'm still seeing 
you know, almost every day it feels like you're seeing a tweet that says, uh, you know, I'm very thankful to be joining this major league organization, that major league organization. These are a lot of college guys that are leaving even in, right now. Um, you know, one of the trends, one of the, what I think is kind of a cool trend is that, um, and maybe this is quite a bit different than it was 10 years ago as well, is that you'll see guys from Division two, II, Division three, junior college programs that are catching on with pro organizations because of the things that they've done. And uh, even in the in the college ranks, it's it's difficult to jump from level to level. Um, ha- has that trend sort of broken down the, the doors, even uh, or broken down the barrier, even at, at the college level, or is it still at the college level that you just you know speaking about what you're doing at Mississippi State, would you still prefer to hire guys that have been closer to your level because of the recruiting aspect or or, or anything else about it? Um, just kind of comparing how you know guys from lower levels jump into the minor leagues, but it's not quite so the case with college baseball yet. Yeah, I, I think there's a bigger dynamic. You know, the, we have the whole scouting side. At the, that's the you know half of it's teaching, half of it's scouting. Um, when you're going in the minor leagues, and it's that you know, and these guys are they know the technology, but they also the biggest piece, and we're finding this here just here with us. I mean, it's one of our bigger battles. Is one. We, I mean, we have every piece of technology you could have here. Our pitching lab, we have more cameras, and I mean, we're adding to our pitching lab all the time, so we can capture all the data, and then we have to learn that, you know, what what does this mean? But also the cues to teach, I think, is the biggest piece, and I think that's why you're seeing some of these young coaches going in and 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 working in the minor leagues and and having success or, or getting pulled into the minor leagues. Um, I can always take somebody. I think I could if they had a good enough track record. I just for me, like when I hired my staff, the, you know, what was their recruiting piece? Um, I'll take the better player <laughs> every time and, you know, still hope we can coach him instead of trying to, you know, upgrade him. So I, I think you're going to see that in time. I think in time you're going to see some of these guys coming back to the college game, right? right. So um, that's going to be the interesting part is where do they get hired at because the, the teaching piece, the development piece is going to be really high with these guys coming out of pro ball, I would imagine. We're seeing it vice versa. I think we're seeing all the superstars coming back to the college game. So, yeah, I've actually spoken to some other know. guys about that, too. It's pretty interesting that I have a former player uh, when I was a junior college coach way back when, uh, a player that came through our system and, and was an NAIA player after that. Um, he was a volunteer at St. Louis, uh, right. published an article about his driveline program with his players, and all of a sudden he gets offered a job in the Angels mm-hmm. organization. And, and he had yeah. been, I believe, a Division II assistant and then went to St. Louis as a volunteer for like one year. He's in right. the Angels organization. And the last time I talked to him, he basically said, like, I, I've had a, a number of pretty good-sized Division I schools that have asked me if I want to come and coach for them. And it's like that's opened up, opened up a lot of doors going into I would imagine. pro ball. So That's right. Because we, you know, like we find – I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm the – smartest guy out there in this new age of coaching right and technology so we're we're trying we're working we're doing i think some of my assistants are a lot better at it than me but we even have younger guys working our program we have kids that are working in our school right like that you know we have a we're an engineering school and a statistics school and a physics school so we have a handful of kids who have interest in it that we're pulling and looking at information and trying to figure things out and the hardest part for me in all this, as soon as we figure something out, everybody's moved to something else, you know. So it's it's trying to stay ahead of the times and figuring out what things you can use to, to really help yourself, um, you know, in this world. When I was in Indiana, all my managers, I say all of them, but about 80% of them, they were from the Kelly Business School, which is one of the top business schools in the country, and they were statistics guys, you know. And they were leaving after four years, and they were going into pro organizations. It was pretty good, pretty cool. You're seeing these guys move off and going into different things because they wanted the baseball analytics piece. We'd have we'd have a couple of them every year on the staff that would break stuff down, and they just you know neat group of kids. That's a lot really smarter cool. than me. <laughs> good to surround yourself with people that are that are uh, that can really be a big asset for you, for That's sure. Right. Uh, all the statistics, all the data that's available to you now, especially at your level, um, how do you – obviously you have a lot of people that are sorting through it, but how do you ultimately, uh, I guess, figure out what needs to be done from the stats you're seeing and, and to you know, what actually needs to happen with the player? You kind of mentioned that you, you get the data, um, you have the analytics, and then you need to figure out how to teach and what exactly you – 
uh, you do with those stats to make your players better. Um, who does that ultimately fall on, or, or does it kind of go up a chain with, with your coaches as far as just how you figure out what the heck to do with these players once you have the numbers? Well, it's a little bit, you know, it's a it's a group effort. We, we You know, we're lucky here we have a player development position. So he deals with all our analytics, breaks it all down, um, works with each coach in certain areas. So he's kind of our point guy, Tyler Younger, really good. And we kind of, you know, deal with some things and, and look at some things internally. And then, um, you know, but we're, we're probably in the middle of the road. We're probably, you know, and some things we're probably still pretty simplistic about. I mean, you know, offensively, we haven't gone into a crazy amount, but we were one of the best offenses in the country last year, you know, and, and led in the SEC in many categories. You know, pitching-wise is for us right now is a little bit easier, but also just, you know, defensive shift and analytics and how we're coaching and making decisions in the game. And my guy, uh, we lost our guy last year, Justin Aguirre, who's with Rep Soto now. But, you know, going into the postseason, he gave me a report every game of, you know, what their pitchers do and what their metrics mean and what we should be looking for. So as you're starting to work off that high spin rate guy in the zone, and we would use it in scouting reports and things like that to let our guys understand and maybe set up our pitching machines so that we could, you know, prepare for that five ball in the zone or, or uh, maybe a really hard curveball guy we were facing, which we never used to do. I mean, we, we probably spend, we never used to hit off pitching machines and we probably do it 50% of the time now trying to simulate other pitches and do other things. It's just, um, you know, it's just a different part of the game the way we're training now. So our BP is not as successful probably, but we're training for game-like situations. That's been a big change to me, something that I think makes tons of sense, but something that you, like even you said, I, I think it was, well, 2014 was my last year of coaching, and even from then until now, that's been a really big change is the uh, the pitching machines that are used in practice now. But between that and a couple other things that you've mentioned, what do you think maybe has been the biggest change in college baseball since you first started coaching at the Citadel until today? You know, I, I think the way we train pitchers and the way the I don't want to say weighted balls, I don't want to say drive line. I don't. There's a lot of different things out there, but that whole world. I mean, is there, I mean, we used to, you know, you'd barely have a guy throwing 90 when I started. Now you see 95 daily. And what these kids are doing, I just think the world of, and it, it goes in a lot of different ways, but I think what Kyle Bodie and them have done at Driveline and, and the world of social media, how it's gotten out there. And I know there's a lot of different variations, but it's pretty special what they, what they're doing in that world, you know, and I think, uh, you know, as you look up and see what pitchers are doing, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> that's the biggest difference in, you know, one of the biggest differences in the game to me. And, um, you know, as guys are training these pitchers and, and how we train them, you know, they just it's just so different. I, I walk into our pitching lab and guys are, you know, they're doing a million different drills. Usually you used to pitch and then you'd fungo some and play in the outfield and then you'd run a couple poles and, you know, 25 years ago when I started and now they're bouncing balls off trampolines and walls and, you know, they're doing every <laughs> everything you can imagine so that they're preparing themselves for their next outing. Uh, talking about these guys, the, the players that you have now that are just, they seem to be just so much better and more advanced than they were. You've got a lot of guys on your team that are, you know, that are going to be future big leaguers. you got a lot of guys that are going to be high draft picks. You have a lot of guys that were pretty good draft picks out of high school. How do you go about managing not only the individuals, but the the expectations that are on your team, and these are 18, 19, 20-year-old guys you're dealing with, how do you deal with that with such a, you know, guys at such a young age, and, and you have all the individual talent and the expectations on the team, how do you manage that as the head coach of a team at uh, that has the accolades and the expectation that Mississippi State does? Well, you know, we, you know, it's the kind of the elephant in the room and we, we, we decide to talk about, you know, we'll, we'll approach certain things if it's the draft or if it's the, you know, the expectations and we try to keep our, you know, I know this is coach speak, but you try to keep it on the day, you know, like, let's, Hey, let's just get better today. Let's do. And, and, but, but there are times we sit down and, you know, we have our, you know, right now we have four of the best juniors probably in the country. Um, and man, there's draft expectations, there's draft stress, there's, you know, we let them meet with all the clubs, but we we block them off a little bit so when the season gets here, they can hopefully they can play and be free. But um, in our world, you know, they know, you know, they know what's out there. And every time they show up to play, it's a lot of scouts and 
anytime. You know, the one thing about this program is, man, anytime we show up to the ballpark and play, it's usually five, ten, twelve, fourteen thousand people. You know, so the pressure in the game for us is probably always there. And the, when you decide to go to a Mississippi State or another, you know, school like this, it's you know you're walking into a very big expectation. You know, it's probably just the, the hardest part is is you know we have a team psychologist that comes in. He's coming in actually next week and. Uh, flies in from the West Coast. Dr. Mario Soto, you know, works with our team. And, you know, at times we work on things as simple as breathing exercises or, you know, how to visualize or, you know, focus and, and different things like that. And, and then also just different things of team building and different things that we work on. But the mental aspect of us is huge because you have to, like I said earlier in the podcast, it's you have to handle failure and you have to handle it on a big stage. I think that's some reason why – Pro organizations, when you look up and see a guy's had a success playing in our league, man, they're just a safer bet to draft because you're you're playing in these – and it's not just at Mississippi State. I mean, go to Arkansas, go to LSU, go to Florida. I mean, just every weekend you are having to put it on the line. So um, it, it's, it's not easy. It's probably one of the hardest things is building chemistry inside of a team and, and inside of a team that's, you know, want, expected to do big things, but you also have guys with very big, personal goals also, right? I mean, we're talking about real money and real uh, careers, and so there's a fine balance between everything. Which would lead me to my the uh, kind of natural next question. Ever since I've known you, since I first met you, you've been uh, – you've always come off as a very even-keeled guy. Uh, what In the baseball world, a guy that people say, you know, has a slow heartbeat um, yeah. in, in a very high-stress position at, as a head coach at Mississippi State. Um, What's your secret to kind of to staying on that level and not letting uh, things get to you personal? Well, I, I don't know. I'm getting to you personal, I guess, is is one thing. I guess in the games, I, our fans get mad. I don't argue enough because Coach Polk <laughs> loves to argue. So we have instant replay now, so you don't get to get too excited uh, as you're playing. But you know, and I'm probably you know I'm probably complaining more. You just don't see it. But it, but in my world, you know, it's I got the job, and, man, everybody was so, you know, hey, great job, excited for you. And then I had a couple dudes like, man, you're walking into a pressure cooker, you know. And I, <laughs> and obviously that's true, but, you know, it's a uh, when you're, you know, the more that's given, the more that's expected. Um, but how do you turn down an opportunity to get Mississippi State and to, to be able to coach and do? And so I try to. I try to keep my eyes focused on us. I try not to get into I, – I don't read the newspaper here. I don't do – I don't deal in those worlds and – like I said, it's, it's more about us and how we do things and, and really how our guys, you know, you put yourself into their personal lives too in terms of developing young men, you know, and how these guys are growing. And we try not to put everything into what these guys are as a ball player. And obviously, I know at the end of the day I'm going to be judged on wins and losses, but we can't get in that day-to-day. -day. It'll drive you crazy if just everything's about that. It's more about these guys getting better, this program getting better, doing things the right way. And usually when you do those things and you work really hard, your program will be all right. And we have the resources here. We can we can recruit. And we've had multiple top five classes coming in already and I'm still out there waiting to be signed, you know, so we feel like we're in, we're in a good position. But it's not easy. You know, it's not easy. You go to Arkansas and lose three games, man, it, it, it hurts. But it hurts just as much as it did at the Citadel or Indiana when you lost the weekend. It's, it's, it's more personal than what other people's opinions are. Awesome. Uh, Coach, I'm going to keep you for a few more minutes, but if we can, I'll try to go through a couple of, uh, of quick hitter questions for you. I'm going to put you on the spot with some stuff, uh, see what we come up with. Um, just kind of the first thing that first thing that pops in your head, just quick answers to these couple That's things, scary. and I'll let you go. All right. We'll see. It won't be too tough, I don't think. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning you are, uh, you're a podcast listener. What's one of your favorite podcasts? I just do all – I do a lot of the ABCAs, just the coaches. You know, so I'll do coaches there, but I'll also do – college football coaches I read I do but the ABCA has done a good group I guess I should say yours though right if I'm on your podcast but I do I like to listen to what all you know I like to listen to the coaches so very good uh favorite school to visit to play at wow I'd say uh coastal Carolina I grew up in Myrtle Beach and I love the area but also I think they have one of the nicest ballparks in the country Who's been the biggest influence on you in your baseball career? I'd say Dan McDonald. Head coach at Louisville, right? And you guys played yeah, together, right? We were college roommates, too. But, you know, still it's uh, 
I always felt like we were a great combination, and he always, the things that I wasn't good at, he was able to, you know, help push and teach and do, and uh, we still talk all the time and very close, but uh, I'd say Dan. What are you most excited about in your life today, um, baseball or otherwise? Say that one more time. What are you most excited about? Something you're most excited about just today, going into today? You know, I think the upcoming season, I mean, I'm so focused daily. I mean, I know uh, my daughters and my wife would be mad, but, you know, i got a great family and great support group. But, uh, you know, we're excited for here. I mean, just being here and having the opportunity to, to run a program like this and, um, you know, being here for these kids. Who's your favorite person to follow on social media? Oh, wow. Is it if, Rex if you're on there. He has all those good videos of crazy stuff that happens in the club. <laughs> Is that a bad one? No, that's a good one. That's a good one. I wear um, one with the dogs because I like watching the dogs do crazy things. So I know that's really off for a baseball coach. That's that's why we ask. A um, couple more. Best college player that you ever coached. Not the guy that had the best major league career, but the best player, the best guy that was on campus. When he was on campus, best player you ever coached. God, that's a hard one. But I, I, I probably got to go Chris Dominguez at Louisville. Um who was really, really good. I, I recruited Brendan McKay, but I didn't coach Brendan, so I can't say Brendan, even though I watched his career. And then last year I had Ethan Small, who was the National Player of the Year. So, But I'd say Chris Dominguez. I coached him longer. And Jake Mangum. How about you throw, forget that one? So. Yeah, it's a good name. <laughs> I've, 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 I've been fortunate I could give you a long list. I just – Jake and Ethan, I only coached for a year. so. Hey, go with the guy you coached they, for a while. They taught me probably more than I taught them. So. <laughs> Last one, um, the best college player you ever coached against, the guy you really didn't want to see on the other side of the field. Oh, it's easy, Kyle Schwarber. So when I was at Louisville, Kyle Schwarber, we could never get that guy out. And they, <laughs> they beat us. I mean, they just poor guy. I When I went to Indiana, I wasn't even sure I liked him when I went to Indiana, but he's too good of a dude. <laughs> like one of the best guys you'll ever meet, but he was a man, great competitor. Everybody, this has been Chris Lamonis. He's the head coach at Mississippi State. I uh, sincerely appreciate you being on the podcast today. A really incredibly successful guy, yet still no ego, very down to earth, and one of the hardest workers you'll find in college sports anywhere. Uh, Chris, really appreciate your time, man, and, and thank you so much for being a part of the podcast today. No problem. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Best of luck to you guys this season. Thank you.